We haven't seen this one. What is up, Iwu crew? Today, we are going to be covering three stories of a few of the world's youngest serial killers. Buckle up, because these shockingly true stories are 45? bound to give you Okay, I'll look nightmares. at 45 after this. If you enjoy true crime, mysteries, and true stories, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. Now, let's get into it. The first what case we will be covering in today's video is that of Harvey Miguel Robinson. Harvey was born on December 6th, 1974 yeah, we just started watching in it. Allentown, Pennsylvania. His father, unfortunately, was an alcoholic who was constantly quick to anger, especially within the walls of his own home. Mr. Robinson's physical and verbal assaults on his wife eventually led Mrs. Robinson to leave both him and Harvey behind in search of her own safety. As he was left alone with his father, Harvey had a remarkably rough childhood. Throughout the course of his early life really no and today? I the constant maltreatment that Harvey later. faced at his father's hand <laughs> we'll resulted see. in Harvey developing anger issues we'll of his see. own. With so much violence know. and pent-up hatred in his life, it was evident by the time fifth? Harvey was 17 years old that something about him appeared to be inherently off. Stop distracting Perhaps me. if the people in Harvey's life had paid a bit more attention to his strange and malicious tendencies as a boy, someone could have prevented the shocking events that would later come. In August of 1992, the violence in Harvey's life reached a limit. In fact, it overflowed. When 29-year-old Joan Berghardt got home from a long shift as a nurse's aide in East Allentown, she was relieved beyond belief to finally relax in bed. Joan was an aspiring nurse who had studied at Lehigh County Community College in the years leading up to 1992. As a recent graduate, she had begun new hobbies that involved joining a local art museum and a hiking club to take up her spare time outside of Dude, work. Dude, hiking clubs Exhausted are so from the scary. Day's events, Joan found that she could barely keep her eyes open once she was in bed. In fact, she was able to bypass her usual insomnia completely and slip into a peaceful sleep within moments. Unfortunately for Joan, she had no idea what kind of monsters were lurking around in the darkness of the night she believed to be so peaceful. Hello, Jack. As she slept, Joan was entirely unaware that she had unwelcome company in her home. None other than 17-year-old Harvey Robinson had managed to silently break into Joan's house. And before she was even aware of his presence, Harvey was already inside her bedroom. 17. Harvey assaulted Joan and then proceeded to quite literally bludgeon her to death. Just like that, Harvey became a violent murderer. But why? And his killing spree had just begun. Why? In the weeks following after Joan Burghardt's murder, local officials were able to swiftly track down Harvey. They found evidence that he had broken I mean, into it's Joan's probably an home older photo of him. prior to killing her. Despite like knowing that Harvey was guilty of burglarizing Joan's home before her death, the investigators had no reason to believe that his burglary was associated with the murder. But in fact, he had been stalking Joan before he struck. Though Harvey was arrested for the burglary, he only ended up going to prison for a total of eight months. Eight Those months. eight months served as a buffer that prevented Harvey for from killing continuing his killing somebody. spree. But then he got out. In June of 1993, Harvey found himself once again looking to continue what he had just started. On a clear June morning, just like any other, 15-year-old Charlotte Schmoyer was on her daily newspaper route for the morning call when her path collided with Harvey. No! Harvey convinced Charlotte to come with him and successfully abducted her. After taking her to a nearby wooded area, Harvey assaulted Charlotte before ultimately stabbing her over 20 times until she drew her last breath. Later that afternoon, one of Charlotte's regular customers noted that they had seen Charlotte's car parked outside their house, but had not seen her at all. Knowing that Charlotte would never willingly leave her vehicle unattended, they decided to call into Charlotte's workplace to report their concern. The morning call also felt that something was wrong with Charlotte because they hadn't heard from her either. And so they contacted the local law enforcement to report that the 15-year-old appeared to be missing. Just hours later, Charlotte's body was found near where she had been abducted. 
almost immediately following his brutal murder of Charlotte Schmoyer. Harvey was actually pulled over by a police officer. Nervous to face the consequences of his actions, Harvey accepted that he had been caught and 15. anticipated his arrest. However, the officer simply handed Harvey a speeding ticket so and let him go on his way. Having once again got away with murder, That's Harvey crazy. felt unstoppable, and he refused to quit while he was ahead. In July of 1993, just one month after murdering Charlotte, Harvey struck once more. While her entire family slept safe and sound in the comfort of their shared family home, 47-year-old Jessica Jean Fortney found herself face to face with a young serial killer. Harvey Robinson mercilessly attacked Jessica in her own home, forcefully assaulted her, and beat her to death. Harvey even left her body for her family to eventually find in the morning. Insanity. While investigators searched for the killers responsible for Joan, Charlotte, and Jessica's murders, they had no idea that they were looking for just one man responsible for all of the heinous crimes. And yet, Harvey was far from satisfied with his crime spree. Over the course of nearly a week, Harvey stalked a five-year-old girl who he had intended to take as his next victim. What? When Harvey finally determined that he had found the proper time to strike, he broke into the girl's family home and attacked her. Harvey brutally assaulted the child in the same way he had with all of his previous victims. This time, he decided to choke the young girl to death. No. Or rather, he had intended to do so. Oh. The child fell unconscious, and Harvey believed that she was dead. <gasps> so, just like Jean Fortney, he left her limp body to be discovered by her family. Wait, she survived? By some miracle, the girl actually managed to survive the horrific attack. And when her parents found her, she proceeded to tell them exactly what had occurred. Oh my Just gosh. Just weeks later, Harvey broke into the home of another woman by the name of Denise Sam Kelly. Harvey attempted to assault Denise, but was unsuccessful as she fought back yes! and was able to break free from his grasp. Get him! Having escaped Harvey's hold on her, Denise ran outside, only to find Dude. that Harvey was still on her heels. He once again tried to subdue her, but Denise refused to go down without a fight. And eventually, fight Harvey gave up and fled the scene. After reporting the attack to local authorities, Denise actively worked with the police to assist them in their investigation. Assuming that Harvey would come back to finish what he had started, police used Denise as bait to trap <gasps> Harvey and catch him red-handed. And fortunately, it worked like a charm. After she had gotten away, Harvey had started stalking Denise, waiting to finish off his attack. Just days after he first tried to assault and kill her, police watched as Harvey once again approached Denise's home. Swiftly, officers attempted to arrest him, but Harvey had come to Denise's house armed, and he pulled a gun on the police officers and abruptly opened fire on them. Police responded with gunfire of their own, which wounded Harvey, but not enough to stop him from escaping. Oh no. Fortunately, Harvey ended up needing significant medical attention as a result of his wounds. He ended up checking himself into a nearby hospital where officers were able to locate him just hours later. Oh, lol. At Harvey's trial, the prosecution was able to connect Harvey to his three murders and two attempted murders by presenting matching DNA that had been collected at each of the crime lol, scenes. Lol, 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 lol. At Harvey Robinson's trial, District Attorney James B. Martin noted, quote, These were horrific killings, and I just thought the death penalty was appropriate under the circumstances. I still think it's appropriate. I think it's appropriate. Harvey Robinson was ultimately... Do you guys... How do you feel about the death penalty in this case? I think it's appropriate in this case. Right? It's warranted. Like this guy, it's almost like he doesn't even have a reason. Like he's just going around killing people. Why would he stop? Danger to society? It's just like, yeah, it's just mindless killing. It's insane. Don't like the death penalty. I like the death penalty. Deserves worse. Should be in jail. Oh, it's like in life, 
it, life in prison or death penalty. It's just so... <sighs> One is just... Uh, it's just a matter of like, is it deserving? Vote time? <laughs> no. sentenced to death and received two additional life sentences for the assaults and serial murders he committed at the age of 17. As of 2021, Harvey is 46 years old and is still imprisoned on death row. To date, he is one of the youngest serial killers in American history. His crimes were later used as an inspiration for a character featured in the show Criminal Minds. Ugh, ugh. The Ew. next case we have for you today is that of 15-year-old James Fairweather. James Fairweather was born on August 5th, 1998 in Colchester, Essex. Maybe like life in prison and then death at a certain age so that they live with the fear and anxiety of dying. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. I just, I just don't like mindless killing like that is insane to me. People, people that don't deserve it, that's crazy. Suffer first and then die. His parents, Great idea. Amigo, James <laughs> Sr., loved their son. Oh, dearly, I don't know. I don't know. And wanted to ensure that their small little family would live a quaint and normal life. Oh, God. Growing up, James was described by teachers as, quote, well behaved and sensitive to the needs of others. Okay. Unfortunately, the quiet behavior that James had been known for oh God, would eventually end up taking a turn for the worse. Throughout his academic career, James became a rather noteworthy bully as he no. claimed that he had feared that he would be bullied himself. James would often get into trouble and ended up blaming anyone and everyone around him for his own Would you guys... This kid became a bully in fear of getting bullied himself. I feel that is kind of, that's kind of interesting. Would you guys, if you have a kid, would you send them to public school? Or would you private school them? I feel like there's pros and cons to both. I feel like private school, you have more control over the development of your child, but they lack the social engagement of other kids. You know, making friends, um, learning. I, I, there's so, oh man, it's so tough. There's like pros and cons to both sides. Uh, public is really good in my country. I also guess it depends on, yeah, where. Private school is expensive. Not like private, private school, but like school from like at home. Where you teach your kid, pretty much. You teach your own kid or a teacher comes. I, I don't really know. There's like private schools where it's still like public, but it's like all girl or all guy. They wear uniforms and stuff. Homeschooling is what I meant. Sorry, I meant homeschooling. That is homeschooling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you rather do homeschooling or public schooling? For sure, school with other kids, just for the social skills. Yeah, I feel like social skills is so important, but like, I feel like there's a lot of kids that just have broken families that are going into public schools and they're reacting from their at-home experiences and retaliating with kids in the public space. Which also, in turn, causes more trauma because of like the bullying and stuff. Bad behavior. Various reports from James's school demonstrated that other bullies often teased James for having larger ears, and many would even refer to him as Dumbo. But the bullying was only a piece of James's rather dark side. Perhaps the most chilling part of James's childhood mm. was the fact that he often Social claimed aspect, that his it was only career aspiration was that he wanted to become a murderer. He had actually grown to have a rather disturbing obsession with serial killers including the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe. When James's grandmother passed away, the building rage he constantly felt toward the world seemed to significantly amplify. Shortly after her passing, James committed his first crime when he robbed a store at Knife Point. He was oh, subsequently no. arrested and sentenced to one year of youth supervision. Unfortunately, 
small, semi-violent crimes were not enough to satisfy James Fairweather. When James was only 15 years old, he decided to push the limits on what he believed he was capable of doing. So, on March 29th, 2014, he, he managed to, to sneak it out of his parents' home. He had armed himself with adults. gloves yeah. and was wielding a knife in search Stop. of anyone unfortunate enough to come across his path. No. Mere moments into his walk, James approached a 33-year-old man named James Atfield, who had been asleep at the moment James Don't spotted the him. James on James Atfield had spent attack. the evening drinking with his friends and had overdone it, which led to him inevitably passing out in a field in Colchester's Castle Park. When James realized that Atfield was unconscious, he decided to make Atfield his first victim. With the knife he had brought with him, James stabbed Atfield in the no! abdomen, head, and face. Oh. According to the later autopsy, James had stabbed him a staggering 102 times. Then, believing that he heard someone coming, James fled from the scene and ran straight home. Though James arrived home around 2.30 in the morning, Atfield's body was not discovered until over three hours later. What? When authorities found Atfield, they quickly rushed him to a nearby emergency room, but he was pronounced dead at 6.31 I mean, a hun Atfield over a hundred times? Of five children and no! had lived with permanent brain damage after a car accident he had been in years prior to his murder. According to- What? How? How does someone go through something like that and gets randomly stabbed over a hundred times? That is insanity! His autopsy, Atfield had a variety of defensive wounds on his arms and hands, leading uh... investigators to believe that he had been conscious enough to try to fight James off during the attack. As part of the investigation into Atfield's death, James was actually interviewed by police as a suspect, but he had a solid alibi, saying that he had been home at the time, and as no one could say otherwise, all suspicion moved on. Just like that, James Fairweather got away with his first murder at the age of 15. Just months later, on June 17, 2014, James once again found himself looking to take another life. This time, James was far bolder in his attack. This time, he decided to strike in broad daylight. No way! As a 31-year-old college student, Nahid Almania was walking to her university at 10.30 in the morning. She had no idea what kind of dangers were lurking nearby. James managed to sneak up behind Nahid and stab her in the back with a bayonet knife before spinning her around and knocking the sunglasses off of her face. Then, James stabbed both of her eyes until she fell to the ground and obtained a massive skull fracture. James stabbed her an additional nine times, fracturing Nahid's rib before he fled the scene. After two disturbing murders... I am never going out in broad daylight ever again. That is crazy. Just any random person can just come up and stab you whenever they want. Her eyes. Yeah, he stabbed her in the eyes. Essex police were on high alert and ended up questioning around 70 local residents who had been known to have a history of knife-related crimes. Once again, including James himself. But he again had an alibi and he was not questioned any further. Huh? By January of the following year, Essex police had located and interviewed more than 900 potential witnesses to both Atfield and Nahid's murders. Perhaps the most confusing aspect of the two killings was that Atfield and Nahid had been two complete strangers with no connection to each other. Considering the fact that they had both been killed at different times of the day, Investigators had first assumed that there could have been two separate individuals responsible for their deaths. Eventually, however, it was determined that, though both victims were selected randomly, Atfield and Nahid were killed by the same person. <sighs> James did not attempt another murder for well over a year after he had killed Nahid because the local police and residents were on high alert. A year. In fact, the community Walking even went out so on the far streets. as to remove brush and bushes from local parks and areas where the victims had been selected. Oh 
Wow. On May 27th, 2015, James was seen loitering around bushes early in the morning in a manner that raised suspicion in the local dog walker who had spotted him. As a result, the woman called the police right away, leading officers to take James in Thank for an interview. Thank you, At the time police located him, he had been wearing rubber gloves and had a knife on him. He was immediately arrested and taken in for questioning regarding his potential roles in the recent Colchester stabbings. That's it, I'm cutting all the when trees down. When authorities looked closer into James's background, they found that he had been completely obsessed with documentaries about serial killers and had even told his psychiatrist that, quote, voices were telling him to burn babies and maim prostitutes. His psychiatrist later said that she believed that the documentaries he watched and violent video games he played could have desensitized him to the idea of murder. I just don't think that video games cause people to kill people. I really don't like that they're putting that in here as if that's a valid reason for why he started murdering people. That that is that is not cool child childhood trauma comes first yeah that's that's an incra that's a crazy thing to add in there like i get the psychiatrist said that first of all she's a psychiatrist and this dude's talking about how like the voices in his head are telling him to like maim prostitutes and kill babies, burn babies. Like, shouldn't you report that? Okay. Boomer mentality. Dude, yeah, a lot of the older generations do think that video games cause people to be more likely to murder. It's just simply not the case. That's not real. Valorant Morka. Executed by Essex Police. James recounts the night he murdered Atfield, asserting that the voices in his head ordered him to do it. Fuck it. Some the voices are talking to me. You need to make a sacrifice so we can come and get you. You need to do it. And I saw him. It was, where it was laying on the grass. Like, like that. Like, 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 this was fast asleep where he was drunk. Then he goes, he goes, he's the one, he's the one, he's the one. Do it, do it. So I went up to him. Can I stand oh, up? Oh no! Yes. Went up to him. No, no, sit down, sit like down! That. I stabbed him first there, and I've done it a few times. While I was doing that, my voices were laughing and laughing and laughing louder and louder. After his arrest, James's name was not disclosed to the public, as he was a minor at the time of his crimes. But he nonetheless went to trial denying the two charges of murder and possession of an illegal weapon. Whoa. Instead, James admitted to two counts of manslaughter, but also asserted that he had psychosis. His psychosis was That's not confirmed so by the court psychiatrist. Though all four psychiatrists who looked into James's mental state agreed that James had an autistic spectrum disorder. James was found unanimously guilty on April 22nd, 2016, and was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 27 years for the atrocious murders he had committed. One of Essex's youngest killers remains imprisoned and is now 22 years old. Bro. Finally, the last case we have for you may be one of the most shocking cases of child killers the world has ever seen. 13? The story of Craig Price. Craig Price was born and raised in the Buttonwoods neighborhoods of Warwick, Rhode Island, in a small working class family. As a teenager, Craig was often described as, quote, a hulking teenage football player with a baby face and a winsome smile who lived with his parents in a small ranch house in the Buttonwoods. Though most serial killer cases include some level of trauma paired with heightened mental issues, there was nothing particularly significant about Craig's childhood that would ultimately influence his later actions. Perhaps that is what makes Craig's behavior all the more chilling. I'm scared. In July of 1987, when Craig was only 13 years old, something inside of him appeared to have shifted dramatically. On the night of July 27th, Craig set out to do something he had never done before. He wanted to kill. But why? With a rather basic plan created and a victim selected, 
Craig set out in the middle of the night, intent to break into the home of one of his neighbors, who lived just two doors down from his own house. After letting himself into the home with ease, Craig quickly went into the kitchen and armed himself with a single knife from the homeowner's kitchen set. Then he snuck into the bedroom of 27-year-old Rebecca Spencer, where she slept. <laughs> Seeing his fate- Lock your doors, everyone! Get up and lock your doors right now! Make sure your doors are locked! Barricade them in! We need wood and nails! We need to- uh, My door doesn't even have a doorknob. Like, you cannot get in here. Okay? I took the wrench off. Not even home? Bro! Go home quick! <laughs> Go <laughs> Go home fast! Okay, okay, no one panic, no one panic. Stop panicking. Don't panic. We're cool. All right. These are very unlikely situations, but we need to be aware of the possibility that it is possible. Just be cautious when going to your car. You know, when you go from your car to your workplace, you know, be sure to have an extra sense of your surroundings. All right. Make sure to have some sort of like defense, maybe a little, you know, a little pocket knife or something. Okay. Something little bit. I'm panicking. Don't panic. Don't panic. Everyone relax. Okay. I started to panic, but I realized if I panic, you will panic. Don't panic. We just have to be prepared. We just have to be prepared. And Rebecca's. Craig proceeded to stab the young woman 58 times until she drew her last breath. Craig swiftly vacated the premises and snuck back into his own home, virtually undetected. 58 times. Even with his lack of life experience and status as a 13-year-old boy, Craig managed to thoroughly clean himself and ensure that there would be no evidence left behind what? that could potentially connect him to Rebecca's murder. The initial investigations into Rebecca's death went cold in the months following the attack. No way! In fact, way. it was completely unsolved for two whole years, and Craig managed to fly under the radar and avoid any and all suspicion. Thrilled by the feeling of success, Craig was satisfied with his first murder, and though he was determined to kill again, he found it best to wait before striking again. So, two years later, when Craig was just 15 years old and a freshman in high school, oh he decided to test his luck once more. But why? Or rather, three times more. On September 1st, 1989, Craig was high on both marijuana and LSD and itching for a thrill. So he stuck to what he was familiar with and set out into his neighborhood in search of a home to infiltrate in the same fashion that he had previously done to Rebecca's home. Having faced various racially charged situations in his youth, Craig decided it would only be appropriate to attack one of the white households in his neighborhood as a sort of revenge. <gasps> Silently, Craig broke into the home of 39-year-old Joan Heaton while she and her two daughters, Jennifer and Melissa, oh were God. sound asleep. Stumbling upon Joan's room first, Craig stabbed the single mother 57 times before leaving her to bleed out. He then found 10-year-old Jennifer, who he stabbed 62 times until he was certain she was dead. Finally, he crushed the skull of 8-year-old Melissa before stabbing her a total of 30 times. Police noted that the stabbings had been so incredibly brutal that Craig had actually broken the handles off of the knives, leaving the blades inside the bodies of his victims. What? As the brutality of the murders was so significant, Local law enforcement was quick to associate the Heaton family murders with Rebecca's earlier murder. In response to the killings, the FBI was called in to profile what everyone assumed to be a cunning serial killer. What they failed to consider was that the serial killer on their hands was a 15-year-old boy. In fact, the only reason that Craig was even caught was that a particularly observant detective had noticed Craig in the neighborhood and realized that he had some noticeably deep cuts on his hands. Ooh. Officials quickly took Craig in for questioning, where the boy openly and proudly admitted to committing the murders on his own accord. At the time of his official arrest, Craig was considered the youngest serial killer in the history of the United States. As a result of his intense crimes, 
Craig gained the nickname the Warwick Slasher and was considered a poor candidate for rehabilitation. At his trials, Craig was charged with the murder of Rebecca, Joan, Jennifer, and Melissa and was incarcerated until his 21st birthday for his crimes. While imprisoned, Craig refused to stay out of trouble and was additionally charged with criminal contempt for refusing a psychological evaluation, extortion for threatening a corrections officer, and assault in violation of probation for fights while in prison. As a result, he was sentenced to an additional 10 to 25, which he is still in the process of serving at Florida State Prison. Just like Harvey Robinson, Craig Price's murders inspired an unsub character on criminal minds. As crazy as these three cases may be, they are not the only horrifying cases of the youngest serial killers in the world. In fact, these cases are barely scratching the surface. Keep your eyes peeled for the second video in this short series, where we die. It's so lame that these people are getting nicknames and characters made after them. Like, obviously, I get why that happens, because it, people are curious, it, they want to know, it's, you know, it's just so unfortunate that, like, that's why some people murder, is because they want the fame and attention. Glorifying them, yeah, it's sickening. Sickening. Oh, God, so young, too.